just to kind of show what these guys are saying causes tides we've got a uh, neil degrasse tyson world-renowned so-called astrophysicist he's just an actor but a lot of people look up to him for what he has to say about space and what do you call him an actor physicist uh, yeah actor, actor physicist yeah world-renowned nice, world nice. <laughs> Let's check out this man right here especially when it comes to science has the answer Okay, so no, I have an answer. Whether or not it's the answer, that's, a, that's to be determined. Please, Bingo. you're ruining what I believe in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the next thing I say may be mind blowing to you. Okay, okay, the tide doesn't actually come in and out. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what happens is there is a bulge of water, two of them on opposite sides of the Earth, caused by the sun and the moon, and Earth turns inside that bulge. Mm -hmm. So when this, when we say the water rises and falls tidally, what's happening is we are rotating into the bulge and then out of the bulge. So the bulge is already it's there. Al is this dude really saying that the, the land of the earth moves underneath the water and the water's being still? Ready there. And all we kind of do is pass through the pass bulge. Pass through and the water gets high and it gets low. <laughs> So we're stuck with language from our own perspective rather than language of what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. It's simpler that way to say the water goes in and out. It's simpler to say the sun set rather than Earth rotated such that our angle of view on the stationary sun fell below our local horizon. Right. Let's look at just the Earth and the moon for the moment. Okay. Okay. Which so many, people, many people think the moon is what causes it. No, the moon is two-thirds of the tides. Okay. Okay. The sun is another, it's two-thirds, three-quarters. Depends on the distance. The sun has its own tides on the Earth. Wait, in fact, the tides that the moon raises on Earth mm -hmm. are the same no matter the phase. Okay, no matter the phase of the moon, which there are some people believe that when you have a full moon, what you have is a higher tide because you have a fuller moon. You do have a higher tide. Oh, snap. But the tide that the moon raises on the Earth is basically the same no matter its phase. No matter its phase. What happens at full moon uh -huh. is that the sun's tides Add to the moon's tides precisely. Oh snap, we talking about a tide assist from the, the tide assist. So you have the moon, the earth, the moon will have the same tide it would at any time, right. but now it lines up with the sun. Right. They add together, you get the highest, highest tides tide. at full moon and new moon. So now I ask you, when would you get the lowest tide? Uh, when the sun is not lined up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me quantify that. So when the sun is at 90 degrees, right. the sun is pulling this, this way, way. And the moon, the moon is pulling, pulling that way, way, and the two waves right. basically cancel. Exactly. They try to cancel one another. So you have the lowest tide. It's called the neap tide. The neap? Neap. Neap tide. Neap tide. Mm -hmm. The side of the Earth that's closest to the moon feels a stronger gravitational pull of the moon and than the, the side, side of the Earth, Earth that's farthest away. Right. Okay. Right. The closer you are to the source of gravity, the stronger is that force. Right. Is that force? And that's true for everything. Right. There's a difference in the gravitational pull from one side to the other. Okay. Because if there's a difference, it means it's pulling this harder than that. If, if you do that, you end up stretching. Okay. So the water stretches along the line that the moon's tidal forces are pulling. Gotcha. Okay, it's a stretching force. Right. All right? And by we're the way, we're going to call that Earth Yoga. <laughs> so, so, yes. <laughs> and now, okay. downward dog. <laughs> and so... And so that bulge is always there, but the sun is messing with it. Right. Okay. Exactly. So as the moon orbits the Earth, and the tidal bulge sort of tidal bulge is tracking, moving, with, moving with the moon. Right. And the sun is like exerting its forces its force simultaneously. It's simultaneously, and it either lines up or it doesn't. Wow. Okay. Good. How much brain you got left to get? I don't know, man. We about this. Okay, so now watch. <laughs> we're only working with this to begin. <laughs> now we dance about this. Okay, so watch it now. No. So it turns out we are rotating faster than the time it takes the moon to go around the Earth. Okay? So a day is shorter than a month. Duh. So we are actually, if, if you, the viewer, are the moon, mm -hmm. and you're trying to raise this bulge. Mm -hmm. Oh, why? Okay? I am dragging the bulge ahead of you. 
because I'm rotating faster. That's right. Okay. So, so the bolt is not actually exactly aligned. No, it's over here. It's, it's, it's like that way. And then that angle. And you're pulling. So now watch. So what? Right. Right. So it's because I'm rotating. So right. now watch. So the moon is actually tugging on that bolt, trying to line it back up. Right. And it does that against the wishes of our rotation. Right. So the tidal bulge, because of the moon, is slowing down the rotation of the Earth. So are you telling me that... That's why we have leap seconds. So the tides are not only responsible for what we perceive as water going in and out, it's, re it's responsible for the slowing down of the rotation Earth. of the Earth. And the Earth has been slowing down ever since the moon has existed. It's false. No way. No. Not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's just insane what we're listening to. And I, I don't think I could have handled him saying bulge one more time. <laughs> they were really into that bulge, weren't they? Man, Ew, this... why? <laughs> I had to use that Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> <laughs> this, these guys, man, like the, it's so funny. I mean, I guess if I was getting paid to be a propagandist like that, I would get enthusiastic and animated about it too. But it, it truly is a, a sleight of hand parlor trick so that you don't focus on what they're actually saying. Right. Because like, he concluded all that nonsense by saying the earth is slowing down. And you're like, what? Like, that's never been measured. What? No. And that means that the sun in the sky, we wouldn't have 24 hour days. It means we'd have longer days. Right. So yeah. all of it's nonsense and unobservable. He said the tides don't go in and out. The earth moves through the bulge of water. Then how come the water doesn't go over the, <laughs> the face yeah. of the land of the dry land? <laughs> yeah. It's silliness. It just makes very little sense. Yeah, Psalms 89 verse 9 says, talking to the Father, the psalmist says, you rule the swelling of the sea. I love that that phrase, that turn phrase, swelling of the sea. When yeah. its waves rise, you still them. So it's just a reminder that the Father is absolutely in control of all of these processes, not some random happenstance based on a uh, cosmic accidental, you know, happenstance. <laughs> Man that they say so the periodic change in in sea level is known as a tide which causes marine waters to rise and fall periodically the height of the tides is directly influenced by the height above sea level and the uh, shape of the coastline and the nearby continental shelf the presence of sloping terrain and bays gives much more range to the tides than what is seen at sea and the defenders of the heliocentric model attribute this phenomenon to gravitational forces exerted by the moon and the sun and for which they resort to complicated explanations, ignoring that other phenomena can produce variations in sea level, too. Right. Let's see what uh, Rectangle says. So he says, if the moon lifted up the water, it is evident that near the land, the water would be drawn away and low instead of at high tide caused. Again, the velocity and path of the moon are uniformed, and it follows that if she exerted any influence on the Earth, that influence could only be a uniform influence. But the tides are not uniformed. At Port Natal, the rise and fall is about six feet, while at Bera, about 600 miles up the coast, the rise and fall is 26 feet. Okay, so recorded observation of the actual tides in real-world reality, practical application, they don't show a uniform rising and falling of the tides as you would expect to see based on the illustration neil degrasse has given us it just does not work like that in reality and even the own their own data that like nasa will give us on the tidal amplitude right the uh the different variations of tides across the earth at different times does not reflect a uniform tide no, range not at all not in the least no but it would make a lot more sense if it was a combination of the uh, the different atmospheric pressure gradient pressure level created by the movement of the sun and the winds that has all these different temperature gradients and make a lot I'd, more sense. I'd say that does help to be, to explain part of it. However, I have a, a little bit of another theory, but okay, let's go on go. here. Yeah. Isaac Newton though, in his book, had, he definitely had a theory or two, didn't he? So in 18, 1687, he wrote this book, Isaac Newton did Freemason, right? Gave an explanation for tides based on his theory of gravitational lunar attraction. Although other scientists at the time presented studies on tides from a dynamics point of view, the Newtonian explanation of the lunar influence is the one currently accepted in the mainstream consensus. Even, I wish I had the quote, even Isaac Newton wasn't confident, shall we say, of this part of his theory. He said this was the weakest of his okay. arguments, the, this, this idea that the, the moon gravitational lunar attraction is what causes the tides. 
So, but this assumption does contradict the data that they themselves expose. If the mass of the sun is 27 million times greater than that of the moon, then the gravitational pull of the sun on the Earth's oceans should be about 177 times that of the moon based on their gravitational math. So if the tides were the result of gravity, the sun would have a tidal generating force many times greater than that of the moon. But that's not what they tell us how it works. Right. <laughs> Even though they say the gravitational forces are the cause. Then the justification they have for this imbalance is that the sun is much farther away, you know, so its gravitational attraction is less. While on the other hand, they have no problem claiming that the sun exerts its gravitational influence on allegedly much more distant, much more massive planets. But it's somehow too weak to have a greater influence on the Earth's ocean tides than the moon. You see this, this mm -hmm. contradiction? Yeah. So according to the Newtonian gravitational theory, it would be expected that the moment of high tide occurs when the moon is exactly over some body of water, like good old rectangle said. But in reality, it never happens this way. What's more paradoxical is the moon doesn't have any kind of gravitational influence to generate tides on large masses of fresh water, such as lakes, large rivers, ponds, or dams, even when the moon is directly above them. Okay. So fresh water, you know, you have salt water, which right. the majority of the oceans are comprised of, and then fresh water, which is, go ahead. Five Great Lakes, massive yeah. bodies of water, no tides. Can you name those Great Lakes? Five Superior, of them. Superior, Ontario, uh, Michigan, um, Supreme, no. Erie and Huron. Erie and Huron, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Homes, yeah. Homes, H-O-M-E-S. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Fun facts. Here's a couple different uh, maps. Now, I believe this one is from NASA. Yeah, NASA and the GSFC official tidal amplitude data, the range of, of mm -hmm. how tides seem to uh, coalesce. However, they don't reflect a uniform bulge, but you see these swellings of the tides. So if you had to count, let's say this zero degrees right here along the equator through the center of the image, if you had to count those circles how many would you say there are? You're looking you at see? one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. I see seven as well. Yeah. Go to the yeah. next slide if you would. Okay. They even have it graphed out and segmented in lines with seven portions. All right. So these do tend to move. If you were to look at an animation, they got to go up and down and swirl around. But it's interesting that every time they, they show you a still image of the tidal amplitude, they have these, these seven swellings out in the middle of the ocean and around the continents. Because this reminds me of what you mentioned earlier, how if there's winds coming in and out, there's rains, waters coming through the dome from the outside of it, and we still have a barometric pressure, then the pressure has to be equalized for it to not become too low pressure or high pressured. Right. He's got to equalize things. So he's got to move things in and out, not just in. Things have to come out of the enclosure of the, of the pressurized system to keep it equal. So... We're reminded, as I mentioned earlier, that there's floodgates in both yeah. the firmament and the fountains of the deep, as they're called. That's right. Yeah. So we're, if we're left to imagine that these things were only designed and created just for the purpose of the flood thousands of years ago and that they were never to be used again, seems impractical to make all these holes entering into the creation and from different angles without ever needing a purpose for them again. So if he does need to push water in and out of the creation, then he has already set up practical gateways for this to happen. Yeah. So if he is pushing water in through the creation from the waters outside of the earth, outside of the firmament, or from the waters of the deep, we know he has seven by the next slide, if you would, from Jubilees. So the Lord opens seven floodgates of the heaven and the mouths of the fountains of the great deep, seven mouths in number, and the floodgates began to pour down water from the heaven 40 days and 40 nights. And the fountains of the deep also sent up waters until the whole world was full of water. Okay. So he did use those specific aspects of the creation for that event. But I would suggest and theorize that he also uses them on a regular basis sure. for different... To, reg to regulate the whole ecosystem of the firmament. Right. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Isn't that cool? You know, if there's any validity to the the tidal amplitude range maps that they show and the animations that they'll they'll give us, that there does seem to be a consistent seven swellings coming up through the ocean, and it would make sense that if these waters are flowing, then those swellings would kind of move and circle around each other, but that there would always be a consistent about seven of them. 
because it's a fountain nice. coming up nice. through the ocean. Nice. Had you ever touch. had you ever considered that before? Well, not with the um, title overlay graphic that you use, but but yes, I definitely considered that uh, water absolutely gets recycled throughout the earth you know in our enclosure good thought brother good thought there's a variety of contributing factors really that could explain tides right the constant flow of rivers in and out of the oceans wind patterns the ebb and flow of temperatures one of the simplest explanations is the variation of the atmospheric pressure too um atmospheric pressure can vary between 990 and 1040 hectopascals and a change in pressure of one hectopascal can cause a compression above sea level that can cause a change of one centimeter in ocean level just based on one atmospheric unit of pressure change right so the variation in sea level due to atmospheric pressure can reach up to 50 centimeters just based on the um, variation and the difference of the pressure that can occur across the years in fact this phenomenon has even been widely studied and these variations are known as barometric tides no moon necessary no gravitational forces definitely are unnecessary because there's barometric tides that exist. So as you mentioned before, the sun and the moon in constant circuit above the earth could also be part of an electromagnetic, you know, interaction uh, in the creation. Some may speculate and the tides that we observe could be partly generated by the effect of the two electromagnetic fields produced by the luminaries. This is possible because water is diamagnetic, right? Diamagnetism is the the tendency of material to oppose the influence of an applied magnetic field, therefore be repelled by it. And it's well known that salt water is a much better conductor of electricity and is therefore affected to a much greater degree than fresh water. That's right. And also the sweet and subtle influences of the constellations, according to Joe. Yeah. So as I mean, who knows to what degree what force all three different classes of luminaries have their influence on our creation. But I, I believe they truly do it according to what you're describing. Absolutely. Like I say, there could be a, a wide variety of contributing factors that causes the tides. We can't pin down and say just this one has to be it. But uh, we can definitely say there's a number of things. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, and. <laughs> They could all be working together, right? New water coming in from the flood, from the uh, fountains of the deep and the rain above. The creator knowing exactly the right amounts, right? So that the barometric pressure doesn't get too wonky, mm-hmm. right? And so I remember back in 2015, there was a, a, a famous pastor that was going back and forth with me about this topic about barometric pressure and the idea of the flood and the floodgates of the firmament and the water cycle. And I was explaining to him that you have to have an enclosure to have atmospheric pressure. You have to. And he was like, well, what happens in in your model when you open the floodgates? What happens? All that barometric pressure would go out. And I'm like, you're assuming that the other side of the model doesn't have barometric pressure also. There you go. Like you're, you're assuming the other side is some vacuum of space. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So what if instead there's like the Bible describes the layers of heaven above are pressurized like ours. Yeah. What, what if it, they have trees and water and land and atmospheric and barometric pressure and all the things that are required for life and sustainability of life. And he'd already created the layers of heaven above mm-hmm. and he didn't create us in this. Vast oh, I like it. Okay. Yeah. You know yeah. He'd yeah. already created all the levels and all the ecosystems and how things right. work with all the trees and land and mountain and water and life forms that Enoch sees in his visions that the angels show him. So it's a weird assumption that modern day Christians have to say that when they try to comprehend the multi-layered firmament model and they think, well, it, if the earth would be special and as far as nothing else in creation is like it and heaven is just full of clouds that everyone just floats around, you know what I mean? You're like, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible describes. No. So it will make a lot more sense that the father knows exactly the type of barometric pressure our enclosure needs and he's got both wind and water and electromagnetic regulators to keep it all functioning properly. So yeah, very, very well put because there would have to be pressure outside of this enclosure in order for water to have been able to shoot in. Right. You see, because you could, you could reason maybe there's, there doesn't need to be pressure above because the water could have just fallen. (laughs) But if water was shooting up from the deep into, you know, into the earth's enclosure, that would require pressure like a, that's right a fountain 